Good afternoon, everybody. I hope that um, anybody who's logged in on the Zoom webinar can hear me. Uh, we're having a couple of tech issues today. We had to figure out the last minute. But um, my name is Representative Josh McLaurin, uh, and I'm joined today by my colleagues in the State House of Representatives. Um, to my right, I'll start with Representative Greg Kennard, Representative Eric Allen, Representative Kim Schofield, Representative Rebecca Mitchell. And right now it looks like we've got Representative Beth Moore participating uh, via Zoom. And together we are members of the Georgia House Democratic Caucus's Committee on Crisis and Prisons. This is a special committee that the Democratic Caucus assembled uh, to deal with a very serious purpose that has only gotten worse in the last couple of years, but has been a longstanding issue in the state of Georgia. And that is that the uh, correctional facilities, the prisons that are operated by the Georgia Department of Corrections uh, face substantial difficulties, both administratively and in terms of the amount of suffering, uh, pain, loss of life that individuals who are incarcerated in those facilities and staff who are employed by those facilities have experienced for years. Um, it has come to our attention due to the work of groups like the Southern Center for Human Rights uh, and other human rights organizations in the state that uh, these conditions have accelerated in a way during COVID that is completely unbelievable and absolutely intolerable. Um, you don't have to take it from me. We've invited witnesses here today who are either formerly incarcerated individuals, people who are family members affected by these conditions, uh, and actually, we might have some testimony today from current and former staff of GDC facilities to testify to some of the very difficult conditions uh, that people face. We've also invited health experts, legal experts to opine on these topics. And ultimately, the goal today for this committee and in our ongoing advocacy, both inside this building and outside this building, is to raise this issue or set of issues the profile of this set of issues to a level of awareness where the public will demand the type of change that we need, which is frankly no less than a complete overhaul of the Georgia Department of Corrections. So while I don't want to preordain a conclusion today uh, unduly, um, the time has sort of come and gone for there to be any real reasonable disagreement about the need for immense change in these facilities. And our hope today is that the people who testify will be able to uh, corroborate that perspective. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to go ahead and start by um, giving the floor to the Southern Center for Human Rights and its Executive Director, Ms. Sarah Tachikin, for being here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Vice Anderson. Please, actually, let me... Um... Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I cannot begin to tell you how grateful we are for this opportunity to tell you what we have seen over the last couple of years. As uh, the chairman said, my name is Sarah Tatanchi and I'm the executive director of the Southern Center for Human Rights. The Southern Center has worked for more than 45 years for equality, dignity, and justice for people impacted by the criminal legal systems in the Deep South. Mr. Chairman laid out what brings us here today very clearly. Georgia prisons have never been a beacon of human rights or human decency. And in fact, every decade in recent memory, there's been a crescendo of violence. Um, I think it's important to look at our history. In the 90s, in 1996 specifically, then commissioner of the Georgia Department of Corrections, donned Rygear, and then with a tactical team, stormed prisons, beating incarcerated people so severely that corrections officers under oath swore that blood spattered across the wall eight feet up in the air. These incidents tri triggered massive media coverage across the nation and a federal lawsuit that our office brought. Um, the Department of Corrections eventually resolved that with, over, uh, with a settlement fee of over $300,000. In the 2000s, horrific and brutal treatment of our youngest and most vulnerable incarcerated people came to light um, when the stories of Lee Arendale State Prison was exposed. At that time, a portion of this prison was used to incarcerate children who had been prosecuted as adults. Um, what was happening then actually brought us to this building on the fourth floor to be specific, a similar hearing like this in 2005 that was convened by Senator Fort and other Democratic members of the Senate. 
um, at that hearing, like today, family members of children who had been maimed, raped, and even killed told their children's stories, showed us their photos, and made it clear that these young people's lives matter. The Southern Center brought another lawsuit um, at that time too, and it resulted in the closing, the permanent closing of that unit and the change of the mission of Lee Arendelle, Lee Arendelle State Prison to a women's prison, the very same one that some of you attempted to visit a few weeks back. In the 2010s, we saw another uptick of violence in Georgia prisons. And in 2013, we issued this report called The Crisis of Violence in Georgia Prisons. During that time, we were privileged to represent a mother, Ms. Rohanda McLean, in a lawsuit against the Georgia Department of Correction uh, that followed the death of her son, Damon, uh, at Hayes State Prison. Damon was one of four men killed in four weeks at Hayes State Prison during that time. For um, in this report from, from 2014, we wrote about 33 homicides that occurred between 2010 and 2014, 33 homicides in four years. For contrast, today, we come to you to talk about um, how in just eight months so far in 2020, there have been at least 48 suspected or confirmed homicides in Georgia prisons. And that's just the tip of the iceberg of the deaths that have happened in these facilities over the last two years. My colleague, Atia Holly, is gonna share more in detail in just a moment. I share these details, not because I enjoy this gruesome trip down memory lane, but because I firmly believe, I know, I think we all know, that if we fail to account for the horrors of our history, we are destined to repeat them in the future. And this is what is happening right now. In my own 20 years on the front lines of prison advocacy in Georgia, I have never seen such horrific, chaotic, and violent conditions in Georgia prisons. The violence, the treatment of people who are ill, and the apathy of those who run these facilities are unconscionable and unacceptable. We are so grateful that last week, the United States Department of Justice heeded our call and launched a federal investigation into the conditions in Georgia prisons. While this is a significant step in our ongoing struggle for accountability for the lives that have been lost and for the people who remain behind bars, we know there is still so much further to go. And this hearing today is one step in that journey. So I must just say once again, how grateful we are to all of you for your interest, for your outrage, for your service, and for your commitment to building a better Georgia for us all. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Hanshi. And now we'd love to hear from attorney Tia Holly. Good afternoon, and thank you for this convening this important conversation. Last week, our office, along with the firm Kirkpatrick, Townsend, and Stockton, filed a lawsuit on behalf of men held in solitary confinement at Georgia State Prison, or GSP for short. We brought this lawsuit because of the treatment of men by KM. KM is a man with schizophrenia and depression. He was moved to tier two, which is one of the most restrictive housing units in the state. For KM, tier two was quote, close to death itself. The unit was like death itself because with few exceptions, KM was trapped in a cell no larger than a parking space, 24 seven for almost two years. The unit was like death itself because it was infested with rats who called the unit home. The unit was like death itself because the toilets were controlled by guards and a prison staff that's operating at 30% capacity. Given KM's psychiatric disabilities, it is not surprising to know that he has attempted to take his own life multiple times and has repeatedly cut himself. This should have resulted in him being placed in a unit or a place where he could receive immediate and appropriate mental health treatment and stabilize. Instead, he was placed in GSP's version of a crisis unit. The first time he was sent to this unit, he was met by a metal bed frame covered in blood. The second time, his entire crisis cell was covered in blood and feces. The third time, the metal bed frame was covered in blood, feces, and urine. So KM took the paper wrappings that his sandwiches came in and made a bed on the bare floor. The irony of GSP is that it's a special mission prison, which means that its stated goal is to provide
provide enhanced services and treatment for men like KM who have serious mental illness. The reality is that KM's experience is typical of more than 300 men being held in GSP solitary unit, 70% of whom have psychiatric disabilities. Self-injury and suicide are disturbingly common at GSP. At least 12 men have committed suicide at this facility in the last two years, and most of those have occurred in the solitary confinement unit. 30% of the suicides in Georgia's prisons have occurred at GSP. But aside from people on the inside and their many loved ones, not many people in the public know of Georgia's prison suicide crisis. And the reason why they don't know is because the Georgia Department of Corrections hasn't issued a single press release about a suicide in its custody in two years. But their unwillingness to inform the public is not limited to suicides. From September 6th to September 13th, 13 people died in Georgia prisons. Their names are David Herring, Troy Harvey, Cody D. Diego, Jesse Gore, William Oglesby, Tony Smith, Jay Berlinson, Fabian Garcia, Justin Worthington, Michael Ledford, one of our former clients, Miracle Wakama, James Brady, and Mark Castleterra. Yet the Department of Corrections didn't issue a single press release, tweet, or website update to announce this cascade of deaths during a seven day period earlier this month. More broadly, the GDC hasn't issued a press release for any of the 19 people killed in its custody this year. And for the more than over two dozen people who were killed last year, it issued press releases for a little over half of them. There are over 45,000 people hidden behind prison walls in this state, often in remote areas. They are prohibited from having social media and cell phones. So they can't film injustices on the inside in the same way that we would do so on the outside. In our experience at the Southern Center, the only way to learn about deaths from the Georgia Department of Corrections is to send endless open records requests. And those responsive documents are often not free and they're not informative. Otherwise, we rely on the occasional reporter who's interested in prison deaths, um, but there aren't that many of those, or we turn to social media posts. But we shouldn't have to search Facebook to learn about deaths in state-run institutions. And we're in the dark about COVID's reach inside the prison. Other, other speakers today will discuss GDC's um, recent history when it comes to COVID-related information and the public nature of it. I just want to briefly touch on it during my remarks. We don't know how many COVID patients there are currently in Georgia prisons, or how many have died since the arrival of the more contagious and more deadly Delta variant. What we do know is that the Department of Corrections declared that it was discontinuing its public COVID tracker. And at the same time, it also declared that masks were optional for staff and incarcerated people. What we also know is that since this agency removed its public COVID tracker system, almost 3,000 Georgians <clears throat> have passed away from this deadly disease. And it's common knowledge that Georgia's hospitals are filled to the brim with seriously ill COVID patients. In an age when we are bombarded with updates on COVID surge in our communities, the GDC's silence is not only deafening, but illogical, given that incarcerated people are five times more likely to contract COVID. The public health crisis does not stop at the prison walls. We need to be educated about COVID's deathly spread so we can stop it. And the only way we know, the only way we can know how to stop it is to know exactly what is happening in prison. It is past time for the GDC to be open and honest about COVID's reach in, in prisons. Now, it will be easy to conclude that lawsuits like the one recently filed against Georgia State Prison are the answer. We should not be lulled into thinking that litigation will solve these issues. This is so for three reasons. One, there aren't nearly enough lawyers skilled and experienced in prison litigation to bring the myriad of cases that need to be brought. Two, prison conditions cases take years and they're difficult both to win and to bring. And three, whether someone can even file a lawsuit challenging prison conditions rests on whether they have gone through the correctional and internal grievance procedures required under the Federal Prison Litigation Reform Act. And like the GDC's lack of transparency, the Prison Litigation Reform Act shields the public from abuses within the courts because it makes it almost impossible for incarcerated people to file lawsuits about their treatment. 
Now, according to the GDC, it maintains a grievance procedure available to all incarcerated people that allows them to complain about their treatment and protects them from the abuses at the heart of today's hearing. That the number of people who have been killed or who have taken their own lives recently is any indication, the grievance procedure is of little use to incarcerated people here in Georgia. You regularly hear from incarcerated people that they can't obtain grievance forms to complain about their treatment because they rarely see the counselors who have them. The inability to both obtain and timely file grievance forms can be the death knell of an otherwise compelling case, whether it's challenging being stabbed in the eye or feeling for your life because there are no staff on, on duty, both of which are complaints I've received this week. The answers to these crises cannot be found in litigation filed by nonprofits, nor can they be found in social media posts. It is imperative that lawmakers and the general public demand the same transparency and accountability from the leaders of our prison system that we would from any other branch of government that we entrust with people's lives. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Terry Holly. And um, we might reserve some time at the end for questions from a broader perspective, but I'd like to go ahead and start hearing from witnesses today, if that's all right. So um, I believe that Ms. Bradley is out in the hallway. Um, if she could come in. And to committee members, this is Ms. Jennifer Bradley. She has been affected in, a, in an unthinkable way by the facilities and the listening audience may be familiar with Ms. Bradley's story, but we wanted to invite you here today, um, understanding that this is a really difficult topic um, for your story to be heard and, and for your family's story to be heard. So thank you for being here, Ms. Bradley. My son, Harrington Sip Fry, lost his life to the festering wound that is our criminal justice system. On March 20, 2020, Sip laid over in half an hour in the Sally Port of Macon State Prison bleeding out, awaiting the critically limited crew. Sip succumbed to stab wounds of his neck and chest. He was a few months short of his release from prison and three months shy of his 24th birthday. Sip was charged with aggravated assault when he was 17 years old on a group of boys he had been in several altercations with. No one was killed, nearly killed, nor seriously injured. With parole time, Sip was given 20 years in the Georgia Department of Corrections. While incarcerated and for the sake of my sanity, Sip was careful not to show me worry. And for the most part, he was strong. But there are some things that he would let weigh on him that he couldn't help but to speak about. Like once hearing screams and later finding out that someone was raped, ignored and extremely delayed medical calls, having to take showers with a friend guarding the door with a knife, freezing winters and sweltering summers due to lack of heating and air inside the dormitory or being placed in a cell with much older, former Olympian boxer and lifer, Yeah Thomas Riley, feeling dehumanized by being served food that wasn't fit to even toss in a pigsty, or being summoned by words like, hey, you inmate, or chow time. The cruel and baseless visitation and phone restrictions were mentally agonizing for both of us. A tactic seemed done only to weaken and ostracize prisoners and their families. Although Sib was in such a bad predicament, he didn't allow the fact that he was incarcerated or what others thought of him dictate who he was as a person. Even in the dead zone as Macon State Prison, Sib still dared to care about others. Other prisoners, as some staff told me that Sib had a reputation in prison for helping other prisoners, feeding them and having me make calls for them because their family didn't have money. Even the very guy who took Sib's life, I was told Sip often fed him and I had made calls to his mother, unaware that he would be the one to cause harm to Sip. I often got calls from Sip saying, Mom, somebody got killed and we're on lockdown. Call his folks and let them know he's okay. Or Mom, can you text this number and tell him so-and-so needs money on his books? One prisoner wrote to me shortly after Sip's death saying, I was incarcerated with your son. It saddened me deeply when I heard of what happened to him. And it was the first time I cried in years. He was a good guy. None of this surprised me to hear about Sip. This was the same kid who would offer me his allowance money for gas. Sip would often give his younger cousins his lunch money if they needed it and check on me before he went to bed. Sip was always more concerned about others 
than he was himself. In addition to this, he was loved by most. He was funny and smart. He graduated with his GED while at Macon State Prison, earning salutatorian of his class. There has been a grave injustice done to me and my family by the Georgia Department of Corrections. Me and my son were so insignificant, him, insignificant to them, prison officials never picked up the phone to notify me of Sip's death. It wasn't until hours later that I received notification from another prisoner. To date, I have never received any of my son's belongings. Sip's absence is profoundly loud in our lives. Our days are dim without him, our nights long and restless. It is one of my most fervent prayers today that out of Sip's blood and out of my family's devastation and pain come a new and improved system that will turn Georgia's Department of Corrections from places of retribution into places of true rehabilitation and restoration. This is a picture of me and my boys. Carrington is the one in the black jacket. This was the last Mother's Day that we took together when Sip was out as a family. I'm the one taking the picture. This was taken in May 2013, and he was arrested September of that same year. Ms. Bradley, thank you for sharing an unbelievably difficult story with us. And we share the same goal. We want to change this system. We want there to be a reckoning for the way that the system has turned away. Um, if, if you're okay with it, I was gonna give the committee an opportunity to ask you a question or respond to your story if, if they like, but. Most definitely. Thank you for sharing with us, Ms. Bradley. What is, what, how do you spell your son's name again? C A R R I N G T O N. Bradley. Fry, F R Y E. I'm very sorry. Thank you. Uh, Representative Schofield. I just want to say, as a mom, you know, I'm sorry. And I, I'm sorry, you know, is not inappropriate. I apologize for the lack of humanity that this state, this prison system had on your son. My question was, what was the response when you asked why you had not been called or received his belongings? What was the response that you received? I was met with a lot of uh, defensiveness. Uh, and told by Commissioner Ward that that wasn't true. They did call me, um, pretty much call me a liar. But you know, we hear you. And thank you for your bravery today. Mm -hmm. Thank you for all of the moms and the sons that are still uh, there. We, we hear you, so thank you for being here today. Thank you. Ms. Bradley, thank you again. Thank you. Here's Ms. Stephanie Lee out in the hallway. Welcome, Ms. Lee. Uh, we've had the opportunity to meet before, but this is the committee on crisis in prisons that we formed to address some of the systemic issues. But I understand that you also have a very deeply personal, uh, very sad story to share with us today. And, and we're here to hear it in, in its entirety. And uh, we may have some questions for you at the end of it. If that's all right. You can proceed whenever, Ms. Lee. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Stephanie Lee. My son, Justin Wilkerson, had just turned 20 when he was sentenced as a first offender. After what would have been five and a half years, he had a 2 p.m. date set for September 30th of this year. He could have been given a second chance at life that he had earned. He was court ordered to take prescribed meds and mental health counseling monthly. Justin had an extensive mental health history with multiple diagnoses, most significantly bipolar one mixed with severe psychotic behaviors and multiple suicide attempts. 
at least seven requiring level two mental health. In spite of his mental health issues, he did everything he could to stay out of trouble so he could come home as evidenced by his disciplinary record. The entire five years he was in prison, he only had one disciplinary referral for contraband, <coughs> smoking a cigarette in which he stated he actually lit a wick to smoke a sausage. This was in February of 2017. Justin had obtained his GED one year prior to high school graduation. The prison did not offer any other program to prepare for his release other than the required courses that he completed early on during his incarceration. And there was no rehabilitation, even though besides his mental health, he had a substance abuse problem. Justin never hurt anyone and wouldn't have unless he was offending himself or his family. Justin was always trying to help people by sharing with others and making them laugh. He never met a stranger and touched lives everywhere he went. The last year of his life was the worst. His biological father died tragically in a house fire, saving his grandson, December 2019. The last time he saw me was on February 15, 2020, before COVID shut the prisons down in March. June 10th through the 15th, Justin was placed in a crisis stabilization unit after an officer found him hanging in his cell and cut him down. A nurse practitioner had DC'd his meds one month prior which was medical malpractice, secondary to non-compliance due to him not showing up to take his meds, even though they were not voluntary since he was court ordered and did so without completing the required Georgia GDC adherent counseling form. Justin should have been seen and evaluated since he was severely depressed. The day after he was released from CSU, he asked to use the phone to call me. Two officers and a search officer took Justin and his cellmate out of their cell at night to a recreational cage away from cam cameras. Had Justin's roommate assault him while handcuffed and the search officer assaulted Justin to his face, ribs, stomach, and legs. He poured hot water on him and his father's obituary and removed all of his personal belongings, even the mattress and cover out of the cell, leaving him with nothing but the metal, metal bed frame denying him from medical care for two days. I received calls from other cellmates reporting this, and it took that long to get through to Warden Hatcher. By that time, Justin hadn't showered in six days. Justin was taken to medical, pics were taken of his injuries, and investigation was started. I was assured that Warden Hatcher, by Warden Hatcher, that the officers would not have contact with Justin. They did and withheld food trays, starving him in solitary. Justin's weight had dropped from 209 pounds to 138 pounds. I reported this to Warden Hatcher, and nothing was done other than Justin being reimbursed $130 for his store food package after he filed a grievance. I asked to see Justin after this incident. Commissioner Timothy Ward refused, denying me the last time I could have seen my son alive due to COVID, even though as a registered nurse, I was working on the front lines in ICU. Justin had been transferred from close to medium to minimum level security to a TC. Because of the indifference shown, even when counselors and officers filled out urgent and even emergent mental health request forms, the GDC failed to address and treat his mental health needs, particularly the last six months of his life. December 10th, 2020, Justin was sent to Smith, one of the most dangerous prisons and was not one of the five prisons reported that he could go to. He was sent there without the required interest system transfer form and with no medications. Justin told me he was not receiving his meds. I called his counselor and medical and he was seen a week later on December 17th, 2020, his meds ordered. I don't know when his meds were received or restarted. Justin was assaulted by a gang in an open cell on December 29th. Instead of placing him in a cell by himself or with an appropriate cellmate, Justin was placed in a closed cell with someone serving life without parole for malice murder. Less than a month after being transferred to Smith and a week after being in isolation on January 5th this year, Warden Adams called me at 9.14 p.m. recording Justin's roommate assaulted him. CPR started at 6.43 and AED applied. He was taken to the hospital and pronounced at 7.37. I should have been notified immediately as his next of kin. Justin's body was released to the coroner before I even knew he was killed. 
I obtained Justin's hospital records that document Smith State Prison officials witnessed Justin's cellmate choke him out at 635. They failed to intervene with a baton, mace, or taser until Justin was unresponsive with no respirations and no pulse, which were never regained. Warden Adams apologized to me for failure to do his job to protect Justin. Warden Hatcher stated that he would not place someone going home in a few months with a lifer. There has been no report of an incident, let alone a homicide, at Smith State Prison. Less than a month later, February 1st, there was announced a new warden of security was hired at Smith. I requested open records and was denied stating that they were protected state secrets. The toxicology reports show the only substance in Justin's system was synthetic marijuana and his antidepressant Zoloft, but no trace of his antipsychotic, prescribed antipsychotic, Cyprexa. The medical examiner still has not completed the autopsy reports. This is over eight months later. I haven't even been able to receive a death certificate. Justin's cellmate has still not been officially charged. There has been no accountability or transparency. I can't let Justin's death be in vain and swept under the rug. In other states, there are laws to protect first offenders from being placed in closed cells with lifers. If they're not in Georgia, I will advocate for that change in honor and memory of my son. Justin's TPM date was September 30th. That's one week from today. We should be celebrating his homecoming instead of grieving and mourning the loss of his life. Justin was not given a death sentence, but he received one because the GDC failed to protect Justin and place him directly in harm's way. He paid the ultimate price with his precious life and ours will never be the same. Justin taught me the meaning of love. He gave me purpose in his life and his death. Now that he no longer has a voice, I will be his voice and a voice for others for change and reform in the GDC. Thank you so much, Ms. Lee. It's a devastating story. Um, and I know that you've had to tell it over and over again. Um, one thing that I'm struck by, and, and you can speak to this if you'd like, is just how bright a light he was in your life and how one of the obstacles to prison reform in this state is that there is a narrative out there that the people inside those walls are somehow different in some fundamental way from the people outside the walls, us sitting here today. Um, but the question I ask myself repeatedly when I look at these facilities is, if you put any human being in conditions like this and you deny them the support they need, whether it's mental health or basic nutrition or whatever it might be, how can we expect people to survive, let alone thrive in those circumstances? And so I guess if, if you could speak to the difficulties, how you saw him change as a result of being forced to be in there. I saw his, his spirit broken, even though most things he didn't share with me because he wanted to protect me. But he, he stayed strong. And even though he had mental health issues, he tried his absolute best to overcome those because you know everyone else was telling him he has to be protected by a gang and he didn't want to be affiliated with gangs because he didn't want to have his sentence lengthened or to lose his life. He wanted nothing more than to come home. He was only 25. He had never been married. He didn't have any children. He wanted to be a dentist. He just wanted to come home, wanted to make me proud of him and show me that he was not the same kid that he was when he was locked up. And he would never be given that chance now. Thank you, Miss Lee. Is there anybody else? Thank you so much for coming today. And we hear you, we see you, and we'll do everything we can. Appreciate it. This is my son, Justin. Justin Wilkerson. Yes. All right. Thank you. All right. Next, we have on the list to hear from Ms. Charmaine Ort. Sorry, this will be our first foray into the virtual technology here. So I think the computer audio should be on. Um, let's see, Ms. Orr, are you there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Perfect. This is working out for now. Great. So please introduce yourself and um, tell us what your connection to the, to the issue is. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. 
Um, my name is Charmaine Wright Orr. Um, I have a son that is currently incarcerated in the Georgian prison system. Um, what you've just heard is stories of two amazing young men that um, ended up in this system. Um, my son also is an amazing young man who got caught up in this system when he just turned 18 years old. Um, I have seven children. It was a Brady Bunch situation. Um, and I have a eight year old who has only known her brother to be um, incarcerated in this system. Um, in the lessons that I'm trying to teach her, uh, I try to convey to her that sometimes people make mistakes and when they make mistakes, they do have to pay for consequences. What I'm not prepared to tell her is that the system that you go into that is not designed to help you to have a second chance or to correct yourself or give you the tools that are necessary to succeed once you've paid your price. Um, I have a really strong relationship with my son. I used to talk to him frequently. What I can tell you is that his experience, his journey um, while in the prison system has been horrendous. Um, starting with the jails, going into the prison system. Um, he has been, uh, when he was first incarcerated, he spent many uh, months in solitary confinement to protect him from other inmates because he was so young. That, um, in my estimation, started his spiral mentally. Um, he had shown signs of mental illness um, along the way, um, but <laughs> nothing serious. But after spending um, two years in the prison system, going from a low level all the way to, um, I believe a level five facility where he spent months on end in solitary confinement. When he got released, um, he was okay at first, but then his spiral mentally went, um, went south. Um, we were trying to get help for him um, and he got diagnosed as being schizophrenic and bipolar. He was unable to um, get the help that he needed because he was on a waiting list. In the meantime of him being on that waiting list, his mental condition spiraled even further and he started, um, um, hallucinating and seeing different things, which ultimately ended him back up into the prison system as he felt um, he was always being attacked or being followed. Since he's been um, in, the, in the prison system the second time, um, he went to a mental facility at first where he was supposed to receive counseling, he was supposed to be on meds, um, and these things started off well, but then clearly and very rapidly deteriorated um, to the point where he was no longer receiving meds. Um, there was an incident that happened and they then transferred him to another prison facility that had no mental health um, resources available. Um, when I inquired with the facility about his condition and his, um, his meds, they, had no record of him being on meds. So he spent the next six months without any meds at all. Since that period of time, I don't believe that he's had any medical intervention. There has been no counselor that has seen him, um, no intervention whatsoever. Um, ultimate, he's been in solitary confinement for at least 18 months. Um, at one point, he uh, got beat up in the middle of the night. I got a phone call that he, uh, from him that he was at a hospital. He has for the last year and a half been um, begging me and telling me that his human rights have been being violated. Um, I've been calling the facilities. I get no response. I get transferred. I get promised phone calls back and they never occur. Um, I've been given phone numbers to the regional, um, um, I, I guess the, the regional, I, I forget what he, he's called, but those phone numbers and that information has been given to me by inmates themselves. Um, the 
system of him being in solitary confinement after he got attacked in the middle of the night. Um, clearly his uh, jaw was broken based off of how he was talking. He couldn't walk for a while and he got released from that facility without fully recovering from the hospital um, within three weeks. Um, then he was returned back to the facility that uh, the altercation occurred at. He had no idea what happened and he has been in solitary confinement since his return there um, in December of 20 um, of 2020. He has not been outside. He has he frequently complains of um, starving because now that there's very little staff, um, the inmates are holding roles of responsibility of handing out trays. And if they don't feel like giving them to them, they don't. So um, he calls and um, asks for food. Um, he's been in the same clothes since he returned from that facility. And he has none. He's been in the same underwear since February. The showers that um, they have, um, I've got reports from him and other inmates, but they only get showers maybe once every 10 days. The toilets that they, um, that they have, that they have control of flushing, don't get flushed but once a week. Um, he, <laughs> there is obviously a system that's in place where if you put money um, and try to get them resources that they can't get by not having food, they don't have access to their own books. Um, so all of these, I, I've uh, listened to the testimony before and the accounts, they all ring true. Um, all of these situations are compounded one upon another. So you have mental health issues, you have inhumane conditions. And what I can tell you is this, my son is no longer there. Um, he has gone from me recognizing his voice to I can't even, the person that is speaking to me now is not him. What I've concluded is that in order for him to deal with the situation that he is facing, his true person has had to hide and whoever is there occupying him is, is protecting him and is in survival mode. Um, the prisons are no place for anybody um, that is in good mental condition, let alone someone who is struggling with schizophrenia or bipolar that have not been on meds. They refer them to this tier two program. I get no information about what that is, what that's about. Um, and my question, um, when I did speak to the um, mental health director one time was, well, how can you hold somebody responsible for the actions that they have when they're off their meds for so long and then put them um, in, a, in a program that is not even suited or designed to bring them to help? So um, I just wanted to let you know that the stories that you've heard are real. They're happening right now since COVID. It has gotten increasingly worse. When representation has gone to visit my son, the prison has the control and the power, so they don't even allow him to be seen. He's been begging to see representation, and they give excuses repeatedly about how he's not available. And um, what I want to, I guess, end with is that, as I told you at the the beginning. My son is amazing. The sons you will hear about for the rest of the day are amazing. And what I'm calling you to do is to be amazing yourself. The definition of amazing person is a person who does remarkable things. It's when a person um, strives to enhance the lives of others and focuses on empowering people. So what I would call for all of you in this room who have any power and influence to do is please be amazing just like these boys are who don't have a voice, you do. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Orr, for your time today and for sharing those stories. I mean, we can only imagine what it must be like to feel like somebody you love becomes a different person or becomes so disconnected from you, taken from you, that 
uh, that your family gets torn apart in that way. And so one of the questions I have is uh, very quickly, you talk about how the people who are incarcerated basically form networks of their own to yeah. replace GDC functions, whether yes. it's providing food, communication, that sort of thing. Can you describe a little bit more about that? I mean, because part of what we're dealing with is that the public lacks awareness of how bad things are in the facilities, but if you start to wonder if that's by design and you see the way that GDC responds to requests for information, can you talk a little bit more about the difficulty of connecting with people inside the facilities? Um, it's, it's impossible. You get the runaround, you don't get to speak to anyone um, except for uh, administrative assistance. So I've never gotten, an op I have had the opportunity to speak to a warden. I've never had the opportunity to speak to anybody in position to get any information about my son in any way. When he got put into the hospital, I was able to receive no information from either facility that he was in. Um, I've only spoken to um, the director of mental health um, a couple of times, but she's never followed up. And she was the one who let me know that they had no records when he got transferred to that facility that he even needed to be on meds. And that was after six months he had been there. Um, the communication isn't through the system itself. The communication is from the inmates that are um, in solitary that have phones. And so if you need evidence of anything, I've spoken to a lot of cellmates or people in cells next to them and they all have phones. And so they record things, there's evidence there because they, they, they make recordings. So, um, but they don't have a voice. Thank you, Ms. Orr. Um, I'm gonna recognize the co-chair of this committee, Representative Kim Schofield to ask a question. Thank you, Ms. Orr. Um, first of all, I wanted to just get the name of your amazing son. Um, I'm unwilling to give that. I have no idea what the retaliation would be if his name is out there based on, on yeah, no. That, that is absolutely fine because I can see in your eyes how amazing he is. And I just wanted to thank you for your courage, your fight. And, you know, when we look about, look at all of the ADA violations that have happened, you know, we'll be looking in that direction to find out these human rights issues are direct correlations to um, the ADA uh, non-compliance. So I'm gonna be looking into that as well. Yeah, the, the, the sad thing about all of this is if we were talking about animals, if this was somebody's pet, um, the whole country would be up in arms. And these are human beings. And I think somehow we've lost sight of just the humanity that is here. But I guarantee you, if this, we were talking about dogs, bunnies, Courses that we would have a totally different outcry. Um, and unfortunately, uh, we're talking about young men here, um, whether they have mental challenges or not, their voices aren't heard, their lives are not valued. Um, and <laughs> it's going to hit home. Um, I just pray to God that if my son does come out of there, that I can find him, that we can get him the help that he needs to find him. But it's sad that you could put a child in prison and they come out a hundred times worse than when they went in. Thank you, Ms. Orton. And yeah, it's um, a good reminder for everybody that another challenge in getting this information out of these facilities is the real risk of retaliation, that if you can identify where the information came from, uh, there's no guarantee whatsoever that you won't get blowback both from other people who are incarcerated and from staff, potentially. Um, and I, I can't imagine that the GDC tries too hard to stop that kind of activity if it's getting information out. So, uh, Rosco, did you have a follow-up? Just know that my prayers are with you and for your son. And I'm going to recognize Representative Beth Moore. Thank you, Ms. Orr, for sharing your son's story with us today. Um, you know, listening to your story and the stories of others who have come before this committee, it, it just highlights what an injustice it is that we even call the system the Department of Corrections. Um, I, I heard you loud and clear when you said that this system does not prepare people like your son to succeed once he has paid his price. 
I'm, on behalf of the state of Georgia, to the extent I can speak for the state, I'm so sorry that our system has failed you, your son, and so many others in Georgia. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about your son um, in terms of you know, how he presented himself before he entered the system and the person that you speak to now on the phone. I, I find that dichotomy to be very telling in terms of how damaging the system is to individuals and how it's not truly a Department of Corrections if it's actually making people worse. So can you tell us a little bit more about your experience with that? Uh, yes. Um, my son prior to this um, was a very determined, very driven. Um, he's a, a very, very smart, very intellectual. Um, he has a um, caring heart and I, the the change that he has and and I've never had and neither in any part of our family has ever had any experience with the criminal justice system so this whole process is all new to me um, it was all new to him um, I could go into the glorification of of um, lifestyles and all that kind of stuff but um, he uh, played sports he he was you know, just your, your, your normal, your normal kid. Um, and now he is my, like I said before, my son and I have been extremely close. The last time I heard his voice because they have to yell, he doesn't have access to a phone. So he has to yell across, um, cells. Um, my son has always been very respectful He's always um, held me in the highest regard. The last time I spoke with him, he called me by my first name and used street language that I have never heard him use because when he's talking to me, he cleans all of that stuff up. There was, he was not there. I, his, his, the tone of his voice was different. His de demeanor, not that I could see him, but his demeanor um, and how he spoke to me was aggressive. Um, it, it, I didn't recognize him at all. I didn't, I didn't recognize the sound of his voice. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Orr. If there's no other questions from committee, thank you again for coming today. We know these are difficult circumstances and uh, we really appreciate your time. Thank you. Uh, before we move on, just a couple things. I want to go ahead and recognize uh, Minority Leader James Beverly, Representative Beverly has joined us, um, is also on the committee, and I think it, it speaks to the prioritization of this issue for our caucus, uh, that the leader is here today and also was with us on our trip to the Arendale State Prison to try to gain access a few weeks ago. Um, I'll just be blunt. We think that this issue ranks among the top issues in the state uh, that the state leadership should be addressing. And, and part of the reason for that is even though it's, you might call it one constituency, the magnitude of the problem, the level of human rights abuses and the amount of suffering and death that people, Georgians and their families are experiencing, it's intolerable. And so I, I think, you know, us being here today and the leader being here today is evidence of our commitment to elevate this issue uh, alongside any other issue that we take up in this building. So with that, um, we'll move on to our next uh, witness. Uh, Ms. Vanessa Garrett is here. And uh, thank you for being here. If you could introduce yourself to the committee. Yes, thank you for having me today. Um, my name is Vanessa Garrett. I am the program manager at Motherhood Beyond Bars. We provide support and direct services to every pregnant and postpartum woman in Georgia prisons and the infant that she leaves behind. Our programs aim to keep families whole and healthy. Motherhood Beyond Bars is currently the only nonprofit in the state that has contact with the caregivers. Thanks to our collaboration with Harvard's public school, I'm sorry, School of Public Health, we're able to track the impacts of maternal incarceration the moment the infant is picked up from the hospital. We work hard to build these relationships with currently incarcerated people and their families. And we hear directly from women and their concerned family members just about daily about the neglect and mistreatment of people held in Georgia's prison system. 
Over the past year, I have been increasingly concerned by the level of neglect that women are experiencing while they are pregnant and in their postpartum stages. Since the passage of House Bill 345, the anti-shackling law, I was hopeful that women serving sentences would no longer experience these bodily harms and indignities. That has not been the case. Women as recent as three weeks ago are still being shackled, strip searched, forced to squat and cough, and lack basic hygiene supplies, such as sanitary napkins and the inadequate amount of clean underwear and uniforms. As you know, all of this has been prohibited by the provisions set forth in House Bill 345, which went into effect on October 1st, 2019. Women routinely complain that their requests for medical attention are ignored until it's almost too late. We recently heard from a woman who went into labor at Helms, which is the facility where the pregnant, all pregnant women in Georgia are. She was in labor for four hours and her cries for help went ignored. When an ambulance was finally called, she was rushed to the hospital and delivered her baby in a hospital elevator, naked from the waist down and vulnerable to the passersby witnessing. In another instance, a woman's request to have her painful episiotomy stitches examined was ignored. It took her two weeks to be seen, and it was confirmed infected, but she received no medical care. That mother, so desperate for help, borrowed a pair of nail clippers, and with the use of a mirror, cut out her swollen and infected stitches. Currently, there's a woman in the infirmary at Lee Arendelle who is being neglected. I know because we just had mothers in the infirmary traumatized by the lack of care that this woman is receiving. They reported that her recent cesarean incisions are exposed, risking infection, and that she's lying in her own feces. She's offered a shower only once a week and is essentially comatose. When these witnesses tried to call home, desperate to work through their own feelings about what they were seeing, they were prevented from using the kiosk for three days. They couldn't use the phone for three days. They were silenced and prevented from seeking help from their family for this emotional trauma that they were witnessing. I have personal experience of GDC's attempt to silence those in their custody. I was released from a GDC work release facility in January of this year. As of April of last year, just as the country was shutting down due to COVID-19, a woman was sick. She was put in isolation. It's a holding cell with no ventilation, no toilet, no bathroom and she wasn't monitored. Through the door, we could hear her gasping and wheezing for air, and we were all scared. Our cries to get help were ignored by staff, so we called home. Some people reached out to the woman's family. Two days later, we were told if we made any calls to our family to report what was happening to the sick woman, we would all have our cell phones confiscated. Scared for her, scared for ourselves, and we were forced into silence. When I was at the Transitional Center, I was one of 10 women who piled into a van every day to clean state facilities. During the height of COVID, five of us on that 10 passenger van became very ill, but only one of us was ever tested. Her COVID result was positive, and only she was brought into quarantine, taking away her phone, taking away her property, and they demanded the rest of us to get back on that van to continue our unpaid labor, risking the community spread of this deadly virus. I can tell many more stories of inadequate medical care, pleas for help going ignored, cries to families intimidated into silence, and women treated with no regard for their humanity. Because of the horrible and horrific experiences I have witnessed firsthand, I've made a commitment through my work and my advocacy at Motherhood Beyond Bars to care for currently incarcerated women by making sure that I am their silence for you, to set some light and to alleviate the traumas caused by these gross violations of their human rights. So I'd like to thank the legislators here today for your attention to this matter and to offer myself as a further resource if you have any <coughs> questions. Thank you, Ms. Garrett, uh, both for testifying to what you've experienced personally and also for the work that you've done. Um, we'll be happy to open it up if anybody has any questions. Um, Representative Moore. Thank you so much for coming forward and, and sharing the stories, your own stories and those of uh, the women around you. 
I find the, the story of the woman with the nail clippers to be the worst of the worst. I was wondering if you could please give us some more details while the media is listening and, and please don't hold back on the language you use to describe what happened to this woman. Um, she had a baby and it required a episiotomy stitches and from the hospital she was sent to the Ariel State Prison. Um, she had mentioned that it was very sore and very painful down there. She could hardly clean um, and she sought medical help. Medical refused to see her the first two times that she asked for help. Um, a lot of the problem I do believe is because she didn't have but one pair of underwear, um, which is beyond crazy to me, especially for a woman who has just had a baby. Um, she explained that to the intake coordinator who said <coughs> that when more came in that they would give it to her. Um, I don't know if that did happen, but I do know that when she finally did get to medical, um, they did look at her and they said, oh yeah, they're swollen. And she said, well, can you help? Can you get antibiotics? And they said, there's nothing we can do. It heals on its own. So she sat like that for another three days and then could no longer sit. And at that point, you know, I received communication from her that they're out. So I was excited, thinking, great, they saw you. They took care of you. And she said, no, I borrowed my roommate's nail clippers um, and borrowed another roommate's mirror and laid there in the bed and cut them out. And I just... Did not want to ask if she cleaned the nail clippers first, but I just knew she was that desperate um, to get them out that she used nail clippers. Thank you. So to summarize, this woman received vaginal stitches mm -hmm. as a result of her birth. Mm -hmm. And she was denied the medical treatment to remove infected stitches from her vagina. And she had to cut them out herself with a pair of nail clippers. Yes. Thank you for sharing that. Okay, is there anybody else um, who has any questions for Ms. Garrett? Thank you, Ms. Garrett. We appreciate your time. And Thank you. I'll note for the record that the committee invited GDC Commissioner Timothy Ward uh, to be present today or his representative. Uh, after hearing testimony like that, I, I don't have a really hard time understanding why he didn't show today. Um, I don't know how you could explain what we just heard. And so I think it's probably easier for folks not to try than it is for them to come and be held accountable. Our next witness is going to be virtual. Um, her name is Ms. Hope Johnson. And Ms. Johnson and I had the pleasure of co-authoring an op-ed recently. Um, so I know that she is devoted to the work and I'm excited to hear what she has, well, not excited to her own work, but I'm, I'm glad to hear what she has to say today. Um, Hope, are you there? Yes, can you hear me? I can, if you could please introduce yourself to the committee. Thanks, um, my name is Hope Johnson and I am a data scientist at the UCLA Law COVID Behind Bars Data Project. I have a background in health data analysis, and together with my team of data scientists and health researchers, I've spent the last year tracking the pandemic in jails, prisons, and detention centers across the United States. Um, my organization, the UCLA Law COVID Behind Bars Data Project, tracks and reports on the pandemic in these settings and is the primary source of data on the pandemic in prisons for the CDC. In addition to collecting and analyzing data, my team advocates for greater transparency and accountability around pandemic response within correctional institutions. So several times a week, my colleagues and I collect data on the number of COVID-19 cases, deaths, tests administered, and vaccinations from state departments of corrections. The lack of transparency and consistency in data reporting by the Georgia Department of Corrections has made this task very challenging. According to data reported by the Georgia Department of Corrections, or the GDC, 93 incarcerated people and four staffers have died of COVID since the beginning of the pandemic in Georgia state prisons. Countless more have been infected with COVID, but because the agency doesn't report any testing data, we do not know whether most cases or very few cases have been detected. 
We do know that at least 3,875 incarcerated people have been infected with COVID and 1,752 prison staff have been infected. Um, and I'm gonna share my screen now to um, kind of illustrate some visuals. Um, is whoever is in charge of this Zoom able to enable screen sharing? Oh, right, okay. So if you'll give me just one second, I'll go to the laptop that does that. Actually, well, it requires a password. Just give me one second. Okay, thanks. I think that's working now. Um, can you all see my screen? Yep, we can see everything great. Perfect. Um, so the Georgia Department of Corrections has the second highest case fatality rate or a percent of those with reported infections who die among all prison systems in the United States. In Alabama, which is the only state with, the high, with a higher case fatality rate than Georgia's, we know that COVID testing is inadequate because testing data is publicly reported. And so this graph shows the case fatality rate in Georgia state prisons, which is represented by the orange line, compared to um, the state uh, case fatality rate with, represented by the blue line. Um, and as you can see, it's consistently higher in Georgia state prisons. And then this graph is, shows the case fatality rate in Georgia prisons compared to other departments of corrections. And as I said, Alabama is the only state with a higher case fatality rate. Um, so a number of factors could be driving the high case fatality rate in Georgia prisons. An unusually high COVID death rate, which um, suggests other kinds of abuse or negligence are likely taking place, under detection of COVID cases or a combination of both. After March 14th, 2021, there were no new COVID deaths reported among the incarcerated population in GDC custody. Um, and that's marked by this first little line. Um, this is surprising given that throughout the pandemic, 5.4 new deaths were reported each month on average. We do not know how many people have died of COVID in GDC custody since mid-March of 2021, but that number is almost certainly higher than zero. The refusal of the GDC to report this essential public health information is a dereliction of their duty to protect the health and safety of the people of Georgia and to be accountable to the public and to the legislators who called this hearing. COVID outbreaks among both incarcerated people and staff members have been widespread and long lasting. Since the beginning of the pandemic, an average of 27% of Georgia state prisons were experiencing a COVID outbreak as defined by the CDC. And this is almost certainly an underestimate. In September of 2020, over half of all Georgia state prisons were experiencing an active COVID outbreak. One of the worst outbreaks took place in Coweta County Correctional Institution, where in December of 2020, more than half of all people behind bars there had an active COVID infection. Um, and this graph is just showing the percentage of Georgia state facilities with an active COVID outbreak over time. On July 19th, the Georgia Department of Corrections took down their data dashboard entirely, claiming this decision was due to the declining number of COVID-19 cases and successful vaccination rates. As soon as the dashboard was removed, the worst of the pandemic took hold outside of Georgia prisons as the Delta variant surged throughout the state. Although GDC cited high vaccination rates as justification for taking down their COVID dashboard, the rate of vaccination among prison staffers was very low only 24% of GDC employees were reported to have been vaccinated at the time of the announcement, and only 62% of incarcerated people in Georgia had gotten at least one dose of the vaccine. Even before the GDC removed their dashboard, poor data reporting practices have almost certainly concealed cases and deaths in prison. In June of 2021, my organization rated the data reporting and quality of each State Department of Corrections with a scorecard. We gave the GDC a failing grade for low data quality and missing key variables. Namely, Georgia included no testing information or active case counts in their COVID tracker. The lack of testing information in particular makes it very difficult to contextualize and trust the COVID data 
that is being reported by the or that was being reported by the GDC before they halted all public reporting of data. I think it's important to emphasize that rather than improving the quality of their publicly reported data, the GDC has stopped reporting COVID data altogether, making unfounded claims about the high rates of vaccination inside their facilities and among staff instead of carrying out their duty to the public. Now is the time for state officials to take resolute steps to gain control over COVID-19 in Georgia's prisons. This starts with the basics, ramped up testing and publicly reporting rates of infection and death for each facility. Other necessary steps include mandated vaccines for prison staff, improved access to healthcare, and reducing the number of people in prisons. The culture of secrecy and resistance to oversight at the Georgia Department of Corrections presents a significant threat to public health and safety. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Johnson. I'm going to open for, for questions or feedback from the committee. I think you laid it out pretty straightforwardly, uh, Ms. Johnson. I mean, those graphs don't lie. We're experiencing another surge, and that's the exact moment that they stopped providing transparency. And to your point, they had work to do before they stopped providing data. And so they've gone in the other direction. Uh, it sounds consistent with everything else we've been hearing today about GDC's, as you put it, uh, culture of obfuscation. Actually, I do have a comment or a question from Representative Moore. Thank you, Ms. Johnson, for tracking this information and presenting it to us today. Um, it's certainly a sad sight to see Georgia, the second worst state in the country in terms of its uh, COVID outbreaks and, and deaths in our system. Is there a state that you've um, that you've noticed that is doing this right in terms of how it's protecting its prison population um, you know, against COVID? Um, yeah, I can answer that question with respect to data transparency and reporting, since that's what I focus on. Um, so two examples come to mind. Um, when we did that data quality and reporting scorecard, West Virginia did very well in terms of having, or the West Virginia De uh, Department of Correction did well in terms of having up-to-date um, data reported on COVID in each um, facility, and the variables were clear and consistently reported, um, and their dashboard is still you know, publicly available. Um, in, and then another dimension of this is, is the testing, how often are tests administered to incarcerated people and staff, because that's really how asymptomatic tested, um, how asymptomatic cases go detected and things like that. Um, and Michigan at one point was doing universal testing of every incarcerated um, person after an out or, uh, after outbreak of the earlier B117 variant. Um, so those are those are two states that I would highlight. Thank you. All right, thank you, Representative Moore. Is there anybody else to talk to Ms. Johnson? Representative Schofield. Ms. Johnson, I just want to say thank you for the work that you've done and quick uh, ask, can I get a copy of those slides? Definitely. I can share them with uh, Representative McLaurin after this. Thank you. Sounds great. Well, thanks for being here today, presenting the information in such a compelling way. Um, we'll do everything we can to act on it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I think our next presenter uh, is also virtual. His name is Mr. Eric Reinhardt. Mr. Reinhardt, are you available? I am, yeah. Okay, great. I'm glad this is working out. Um, if you could please introduce yourself to the committee. All right. So I've been asked to come here in my capacity as a public health researcher and as a physician. I'm the lead health and justice systems researcher at the World Bank. I'm also a physician at Northwestern University in Chicago. Over the last 18 months, all of my time has been spent doing research on the public health consequences of mass incarceration in the US. And while many of the people who have spoken here are focusing specifically on the consequences of mass incarceration for people who are incarcerated and for staff, uh, my research has focused on the consequences of the system for broader communities. What has gone largely unremarked upon in popular media is that the crisis in COVID-19 cases in jails and prisons across the country fuels spread for everyone else. So I had a recent study that came out in the Journal of the American Medical Association that shows that the most, one of the most effective policies that any government, local, state, or federal can implement 
is large-scale decarceration. This is one of the most effective policies for reducing the number of cases in US counties. So we looked, for example, in this particular study, we use methods that economists usually use to look at the effect of policies on economic growth. But rather than looking at economic growth, we looked at the growth in COVID rates. What we showed is that by large scale decarceration, you can reduce the rate of COVID growth in US counties by 2%. In fact, you could, I'm certain, increase it by more, but with the data that we had, we showed it. You could, every day you could reduce the rate of growth by 2%. Because growth rates compound, that may sound like a, a small number, but in fact, it's a huge number. Over the course of the pandemic, this would have prevented millions of cases in the US and tens of thousands of deaths. What this study underlines, and all of my research to this point underlines, is that when we neglect the health and welfare of people who are incarcerated, we don't just harm them and the staff that are charged with caring for them, even if that's done quite poorly, we harm all of our communities. This is a politically demanding research finding because it says to our policymakers across the country, including in Georgia, if you fail to stem the tide of infectious diseases in US jails and prisons, you are promoting an epidemic engine that harms everybody, not just racialized poor communities of color that are subject to hyper-incarceration. Even the wealthiest, most privileged communities in the US suffer the consequences of this because biological networks do not only not respect prison walls, they do not respect segregation in neighborhoods, they don't respect state boundaries, they don't respect national boundaries. The US system of mass incarceration is an, an enormous international hazard. Nobody is able to quantify this because the data doesn't exist, but there is no question that the US system of mass incarceration, which holds 25% of the world's incarcerated people, despite being the richest country in the world that holds only 4% of the total global population, that this system has fueled the pandemic for the entire world. And it has harmed no one more than US communities. Millions of cases, tens, of, at least tens of thousands of deaths, perhaps more, are attributable to spread through the system. And let me explain why or how this happens. So jails, for example, you have about 11 million people in the United States who are admitted to a jail and released every single year. Most people stay, according to the Bureau of Justice Statistics, only a few days, matter of weeks. The turnover weight in US jails is 53%. This is a little different in prisons, but some of the same dynamics apply, but let me explain jails first. That means that you arrest people in the vast majority of cases for minor alleged crimes, and many of these people will actually never be convicted of the alleged crimes for which they have been arrested and put in jail. But you arrest them, you forcibly take them to jail. There is no riskier site for the transmission of COVID-19 than US jails. A study has shown this by Yale researchers, the highest rate of transmission of this virus anywhere in the world beyond even confined cruise ships is in US jails and prisons. So you put people in this extremely high risk space, many of them are infected and they won't know because it takes days, four to five, before the incubation period elapses, where you're gonna show up positive on a test. So many people are arrested, they're released the next day, two days later, three days later, four days later. They may even be tested and they're gonna have a negative test, but they'll go home to their families, to their loved ones, to their communities, and they'll be infected and not know it. And we know that this virus transmits asymptomatically. Somebody could never have any symptoms, could be infected from their short stay in a jail or their encounter with a police officer, many of whom are not vaccinated, and then they transmit to communities. So that's the mechanism that's at play here. It's different in prisons because you do not have the same rate of turnover, but you still have massive spread there, really quick transmission. And I don't know exactly the number in Georgia, but nationally we have about 420,000 jail and prison guards. That's 420,000 people, not including other staff who go in and out of these spaces every day. Their health is at risk, but also the health of their families and their communities. This is why jails and prisons operate as an epidemic engine. If we do not address the fact that the conditions of mass incarceration, horrible sanitation, tight constrained spaces where you cannot socially distance, low rates of vaccination among staff, we don't address the fact that this is a hazard for everybody, we are maintaining a system that completely undermines US public health and safety for everybody. Now, what we need, in my view, and in the view of other scholars in this area, is a national decarceration program. Ms. Orr was speaking about her son, for example. Somebody who has been incarcerated, think about Ms. Orr's son, if, if I may invoke him, Ms. Orr. 
Somebody who has been incarcerated and then is released, whether it's just from jail or whether they've stayed a long time in prison, they face major disadvantages when they re-enter American society. They are discriminated against legally, not even thinking about informal discrimination, but legally in the housing market, in the employment market, in healthcare access. These are things that people who have been incarcerated really need. Homelessness is not really good for, presenting, per, for preventing recidivism. Lack of access to mental health care is not very good for preventing recidivism. So if we're going to release people, which we absolutely need to do, there are about a million people in the US, conservatively estimated, estimated that for whom there's no public interest that is served by their continued incarceration. If we're gonna release large numbers of people, which has to happen, we have to provide them with support. We need an organized system of mass decarceration. We have spent decades in this country spending tri literally trillions of dollars, $220 billion a year right now on policing and caging people. That's a lot of money. It's gonna take that kind of money to dismantle this system. Georgia has an opportunity to respond to a horrific crisis of cruelty, of violence, and of disease transmission that threatens the entire country. If Georgia can take leadership here, you can become a model for other states around the country that face the same problems. And that's gonna require mass decarceration in a planned way where you have focused support. This is a major public health policy. It should be absolutely core to national and state public health agendas, because this is not just about humane treatment of people who are confined in inhumane contexts. It's about protecting American communities writ large. This affects nobody more than communities of color, because that's where most of these people who are released from jails and prisons and carry the virus with them are often guards. These are not particularly desirable jobs in many instances. It's communities of color that are most affected, but it's everybody. So the kind of the underpinnings of all my research or this argument that we need mass decarceration as a core national and state policy for addressing this crisis. I'm gonna put in the chat here so everybody can see it four articles, some of them are news articles and others that kind of explain the basic logic at play here and also make reference to the evidence to support the statements that I've given you because I'm here as a public health expert. I'm a bit upset <laughs> about this because I've been shouting this for a year and a half. So maybe I sound not as much like a scientist as I should, but everything that I'm saying is backed by robust evidence in the top science and medical journals in the world. And yet you don't see it on the front page of the New York Times or USA Today very often because it's difficult. But that's what lawmakers have to do. You have to confront difficult problems and provide solutions. And so I'm hopeful that you'll be able to do that. Thank you, uh, Mr. Reinhardt. And perhaps I should have been calling you uh, Dr. Reinhardt if, if that's more applicable. Either way is fine with me. Thank you. But uh, you know, we appreciate your comments today. I think one of the things that really resonates with me is this idea that there are a whole host of problems that policymakers have to address if they want to address the, the issues we're talking about today as a whole. And I think there's a theme here of hiding or attempting to hide uh, the ill effects of problems that we don't want to address as a society behind walls where we can't see. And what we think in our naivete and our ignorance is that if we put those problems behind those walls, they will not rear, the problems themselves will not reemerge again and hit us back even harder. And so to this point, I know that you're speaking about it uh, from a public health perspective, specifically uh, just from the epidemiology of it. And we have a, an epidemiologist here on the committee uh, who I'm sure could weigh in, but uh, you know, it, we, we think that we can cabin problems to, to one area or another when in fact those, those problems have a way of spreading beyond our control. So um, really appreciate your insight, both from a scientific perspective and thematically what it means for how we should address uh, topics like this in general. Does anybody on the committee have a, a question for Dr. Reinhardt or a comment? Representative Moore. Thank you, Dr. Reinhardt, for bringing your research to this committee and, and sharing with us. You know, there's this common sentiment that, you know, if we lock more people up, we'll be safer as a society. But as you said, you, the United States is 25% of the prison population even though it is 4% of the overall worldwide population, which sounds like it would make us the safest country in the world, and yet we're not. Um, so, you know, for those out there who think that the simple solution to growing rates of crime, which is happening across the United States, uh, that the solution is to incarcerate more people, how would you respond to that? You know, it's really unfortunate, the power that this phrase public safety has in the US 
because of the corruption of that phrase. That phrase has been used for decades to defend investments in policing and incarceration rather than in social systems. That phrase is dominated by police metrics, by crime metrics alone. But if we're going to talk about real public safety, what are the real threats to safety in America? For the last 18 months, it's been COVID-19. Far and away, the biggest threat to police safety uh, is also COVID-19, not violence. But all the time, the biggest threats to American safety are a poor healthcare infrastructure, poor public health, poor housing, addiction issues that are not treated. This is what kills far more Americans than violent crime. Violent crime is real. Violent crime needs to be addressed, but it is not effectively addressed by locking people up in conditions that do not encourage development. They do not encourage kind of transformation. There are prison systems in the world that do do this. You can look at Norway, you can look at Finland. They spend three to four times as much per year on the people that they incarcerate. And they incarcerate them in apartments where they go during the day to then have a job and they come back. These are actual transformational sites. Prisons can be rather different than how we operate them in the US. Prisons as we operate them in the US do not improve public safety. There is abundant evidence that shows this. They do not reduce violent crime. In many contexts, they increase it. Also, the number of people that we keep in jails who are, have not been convicted of a crime, and in most instances, the vast, literally the vast majority, by 80%, are there for alleged offenses that are nonviolent. They don't entail an immediate threat to another person. They're around property crimes, around poverty. We use our prison system to manage problems of poverty. So, I mean, I started with the phrase public safety, which is what you asked about. And I think one of the most important things that we can do as a public is to insert a gap between policing ideas and what public, what actually achieves public safety. We need public investments in support systems. We are not only not the safest country in the world, we are actually remarkably less safe than Western European nations, for example, that incarcerate at about 15% the rate we do. We have higher violent crime rates, we have higher property crime rates. This is not a safe country. And it's a huge part of that is the fact that we have relied upon policing and incarceration to deal with social problems that are the consequences of inequality, poor labor protections, poor housing infrastructure. A lot of people cannot afford the private housing market, which is extremely expensive. You work a minimum wage job, you can't afford a two bedroom apartment in the vast majority of places around the country. These are the threats to public safety. So until we can reconceptualize that term, I think we should maybe banish it or emphasize every time we say public safety, what are we really talking about? Because if you're just talking about crime rates, say that. And there are better ways to reduce crime rates than just policing and incarceration. But if you're talking about public safety, that entails a lot of other investments that we are not making. We have the money. We're spending it on the wrong things. Incredibly well said, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Reinhardt, and I share your zeal for a lot of your perspectives and issues. I think the thing that I wanna leave with anybody watching today on your point of the phrase public safety is for people to consider the horrifying, unbelievable testimony about what's going on in the GDC facilities and then reflect on, ask themselves the question, is this public safety? Because the answer to that question is no. And I think we should all be able to agree that the answer to that is no. And uh, Rep Allen, if you wanna to speak to that. Yeah, I, 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 thank you, Dr. Reinhardt, for your, your comments. W one of the things that I was struck by is that conversation about public safety. We, we have heard from mothers this earlier that their children were not given public safety. And the question has to be asked, are they not Georgians also? Right. Um, you know, I, I worked before being in office with the Department of Behavioral Health here in Georgia. Yeah. And I can tell you that Georgia has a problem with institutions. And it's not just our prisons. Um, we are currently, and most people don't like to talk about it, but the Department of Behavioral Health is currently under DOJ oversight for violations of ADA and CRIPA, mm -hmm. Civil Rights for Institutionalized Persons Act. Those are actively going on now. And nothing is going to change in this state unless there is that pressure. But it is extremely frustrating for you, for you to connect those dots for me, which I appreciate. But the, the term public safety has avoided so many Georgian families. 
we've, we've only heard a few, but that term, whether it be within our Department of Corrections or, and, and I will say that the, the mental health system has gotten better, but it still has problems. But that term is one that we should be elevating because public safety is in our sight for all Georgians, whether they are incarcerated or on the street. We should be just as zealous about protecting them as we are anyone else. And that's from violence. That's from COVID. That's from everything. So I, I appreciate your, your comments on that and bring clarity to how we should really be using the word public safety. Yes. Thank you. Let me turn on your... I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to ask, is there anything else uh, from the committee for Dr. Reiner? Dr. Reiner, we really appreciate you coming today. Um, there have been some comments I've noticed in the chat about your passion. And I think if, if all of us had half the energy that you have about this to get this right and to care about people and not turn our eyes away from some of the obvious ways that we can do that, uh, we'd be in a, a much better position as a state. So thank you. Thank you. All right, this is gonna be kind of an interesting segue because I'm not sure if this is going to happen exactly as I would like it to, but um, I have been in contact with a currently employed correctional officer at Lee Arendale State Prison. Uh, this person is willing to uh, testify today for the committee anonymously via cell phone um, while on the job, I think. Uh, so, this is an immense risk that this person is taking to testify today, uh, but they told me that it was the right thing to do, is what they said, and, and I repeatedly said, you know, this could be risky because we know that there's retaliation within the system, uh, but this person agreed to a phone call in the right now sort of time range, so I'm going to attempt to give this person a call and hold the phone up to uh, the microphone, and we'll, we'll see if this works. And Obviously, I will not be identifying this person. Yeah. Hey, it's Josh McLaurin, uh, and we are live in the committee. Do you have a minute to talk now? Okay, I'm about to put you on speakerphone where everybody can hear you, all right? Can you hear me? Yes, sir, I can. Okay, thank you for agreeing to talk to us today. We've heard a lot of testimony today uh, already from other witnesses about conditions inside Department of Corrections facilities. Um, just gonna ask you a couple questions and kind of repeat things that we've discussed before. You are currently employed at Lee Arendale State Prison, is that right? Yes, sir, I am. And we heard some testimony today about inability to get medical care uh, to women who are incarcerated at that facility, lack of supplies, uh, kind of dirty conditions. Can, can you just in general, and I know we've discussed some of this before, go over some of those things at a high level for us? Yes, sir, I can. So when it comes to our inability to be able to get uh, hygiene supplies for them, um, we're able to get um, pads, which they they use um, tampons are hard to get a hold of, specifically due to the fact that uh, they like to go ahead and use them to smoke with. But even trying to get a hold of pads for them to use is hard. Um, when it comes to medical care, um, <clears throat> we lack the ability to get them in to our uh, medical facility due to the fact that we just, we don't have any officers, the lack of number of officers to be able to get them up there. And also because we don't have enough medical staff to be able to treat all of them. At any given time about how many people are on duty to supervise the whole prison? On a good day, six to seven officers. And that's for how many people incarcerated? At the moment, it's 12, I think it's about 1,200 or so. You mentioned at one point there might be hundreds of people assigned to one person? Yes, sir. So, uh, recently, um, I was assigned to look after 
roughly 400 inmates to myself. What do you even do in a situation like that? I mean, practically speaking, how can you respond to anything? Practically speaking, you can't. You, in those kind of situations, you have to take into consideration your own safety against their safety, which it's it's difficult to, to put that into consideration. But you, if you stick yourself into that situation, you might as well you're going to be on the receiving end of that. And if you can't get to them, how can anybody else get to them? If there's a medical incident, you know, who's directly responsible for doing triage and responding? I mean, how does that work? Um, the officer is going to be the first, the first line to get there. But uh, when it comes to being able to do triage and anything, we, we are dependent upon a nurse to be able to get down to that, uh, to that area if we cannot get that inmate up there. And a lot of times there's about one to two nurses on shift and they can't even respond to, to uh, treat that individual. Okay. And um, I know you, I'm trying to remember, you told me a story about uh, somebody getting medical evac recently and what was the warden's response to that? Can you speak to that? Uh, recently we had to send out three inmates due to getting significantly injured in a fight. And the warden's response to that was more or less just a shrug that it is it is what it is. Um, there was no specific, I wouldn't use the word care for, but he was just uh, shrugged off like it was nothing. You also mentioned to me at one point, I think something about what the warden said about danger dangerousness in prisons in general and how bad it had to be yes sir uh, specifically um his exact words were giving the state of our prison that our prison was not a problem um our staffing was not an issue at all we were not understaffed and until you have five to six sevens a day your prison is not a danger at all he, his comment was until you have five to six stabbings a day your prison is not a problem yes sir We've got a couple more questions from the committee. People are passing me. Um, can we talk to you a little bit about COVID? Are there any sort of protocols in place in the in the prison to address COVID, like masks, social distancing, that sort of thing? We're late. Move. You doing all right? It comes to COVID, uh, we try to do mask mandates, but uh, um, that's dependent upon the inmates themselves being able to, or complying with those max, mask mandates. Okay. What about testing, vaccines, any data on that? Um, they try to do um, testing and vaccines, but again, it's not mandated and it's up to the discretion of those inmates if they wish to get them or not. Can you speak about the quality of any food? Um, the food is, it's, and cooked by the inmates themselves. Um, at times, the, the food can be, I wouldn't use the word edible, but it can be pleasing. But uh, nine times out of 10, it's the portions and the the consistency of the food is, it's uh, outright disgusting. We um, have heard testimony that women who are postpartum are still being illegally shackled, uh, subjected to solitary confinement, um, forced to squat, things like that. Can you testify to any of that? Um, the squatting, uh, I cannot, when it comes to the shackling and the, sol uh, the solitary confinement, I know recently due to what I've been told due to the fact of COVID that everybody who goes out of the prison has to be confined for, I do believe it was, at first it was 14 days, now it's bound to 10 or 7, and when it comes to shackling, um, it's, uh, from my knowledge, that was just, uh, everybody has to be shackled, but I know that um, postpartums are not supposed to be, but it's not, it's not um, delegated down to an individuals that are transporting 
postpartums. So if I'm understanding you correctly, it's a GDC-wide policy has to be shackled and you're not making exceptions according to the law, right? Uh, that's my knowledge, yeah. Okay. What about if you could speak a little bit to some of the, the conditions, the dangerousness? I know we mentioned before either gangs or K2. If you could talk about either of those things. Um, gangs inside the prison route, it's a, it's a big problem. Um, to put it lightly, the gangs pretty much run the prisons. Um, if they want something done, they're going to get it done, especially with the lack of staffing. There's not really much you can do to stop it. You can attempt to prevent it. But you put yourself on the uh, on the burner per se when you uh, when you try to intervene with that kind of stuff. K two and drugs is also a big problem. Um, it's hard to stop or even identify K two. Um, uh, the current way of thinking it in is it's on a liquid form. They spray on paper and they use the legal mail system, which we cannot by law. Um, actually look at and examine to get their uh, spray K2 paper into the facility. Um, meth and also marijuana is making a big uh, appearance inside the prisons at the moment. And that's also difficult how it's getting in and put a stop to it. Uh, you know, I, I talked to one of your former colleagues recently who suggested to me in terms of um, salary and compensation that he didn't think that this was really a compensation issue because of how dangerous it was in terms of trying to keep people. Do you have any thoughts on GDC trying to keep people and, you know, what they can do about staffing, if anything? I mean, specifically now when it comes to staffing, if they're not going to, not going to try putting a 100% into getting more individuals in to work at the prisons, they need to take a Good hard look at stop trying to run the prison at 100 percent either start putting restrictions on movements or centering their officers around your high risk areas where it's difficult to get an officer to respond in the event that uh, you have an officer involved in a fight or inmates fighting or even try putting a higher emphasis on getting equipment that can assist the officer in maintaining control Recently, there was my understanding was that there was a visit after the few of us tried to visit and we were denied entry. My understanding is there was a different visit where staffing levels were adjusted. Can you speak to that? Yeah, uh, recently we had an individual, I don't know that individual status, visited the prison, but it was a big enough, uh, a big enough uproar that the um, warden and colleagues decided to do what we call uh, dog and pony show, which they tried to make the prison look like it was running at 100%. They pulled 10 officers from different prisons to staff posts, and those officers had absolutely no idea what they were doing. They come from uh, facilities where it's minimum risk or it's a work and release kind of institution. Um, they threw fresh paint on walls that are killing with mold. Um, they had pressure wash um, sidewalks and everything, make everything look like it was up to care. Even the food that day was, uh, the menu was altered to proportions that followed the law and everything else. Okay. I think we've covered most of the things we talked about. Um, do you have any final reflections on working at Lee Arendale for GDC that you would like to share? Um, working for GDC as a whole so far, um, it could have its um, moments. The training you can get is good, but working at this current facility, um, it's at this point, it's just a paycheck. There's no pleasure in working there. All the officers that work there look at it as a day to day. We absolutely despise working there. And we know that there's no support of the upper administration. That it's just the officers on the ground that we have to watch our own backs and know that whatever we do, we're not going to have the support of the upper individuals. And you, you told me that you're also looking for a new job right now, right? 
Yes, I am. I currently have applications put into other other areas to uh, to get out of that prison. Understood. Well, again, we really do appreciate you taking the time and taking the risk today to talk to us. I know you're doing it. Uh, give me one sec. Uh, that uh, you're doing this because um, you think it's the right thing to do, and and we like you would would like to see some changes in the facility. Yes, sir. All right. Have a good day. Thank you again. You too, sir. Well, I think a lot of that speaks for itself. Uh, the next person on our list to testify today is Miss Nicole Weeson. In just a minute, yeah, we'll we'll get there. Um, Ms. Weeson, if you could introduce yourself to me, please. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chairman Mueller and committee members. My name is Nicole Weeson. My GDC number is 100668294. I'm also a program development manager for the National Incarceration Association. I speak on behalf of our CEO, Kate Basha, and the NIA family. <clears throat> in concert with other organizations and advocacy partners, the National Incarceration Association manages files of hundreds of family situations with incarcerated loved ones in efforts to keep them safe and developing as humans, despite the systemic dysfunction of incarceration. While in recent reports and complaints have triggered inquiries and investigations into the Department of Corrections, it is a particular state of Georgia where millions of Americans and tens of thousands of Georgians suffering unmeasured indecencies as humans while the incarceral custodial care of the state is no new discovery for us and no novel set of allegations. If investigations proceed in honest and sincere earnest, you will find that in relevant respects, drugs and contraband are accessible while in the state carceral custodial care to current as they are in the city streets where arrests flourish most. You will find that jails, prisons, and our communities and networks and enterprises and special relationships, circles of illegal, unethical, unresponsible, unfair behavior among the incarcerated along and facilitated by those wearing uniforms. Too many of them caught up in the adversaries of the web of devaluation. You will find a threat of pretend disbelief by those in charge and a sad disconnect of the truth that it is all by those elected to keep us safe. You will find stories and evidence of gang violence, gang control getting worse and worse, so worse that the gangs openly brag about their control with no contested or active rebuke from the state. You will find dangerous inaccuracies and lack of follow-up in the accounting of grievances filed by incarcerated people that the idea of the ombudsman is not independent at all, as it is definitive in the word. You will find tested patterns of how best to ignore incarcerated people who feel threatened, tested patterns of how best to make examples of vulnerable incarcerated people who dare to complain, tested and prescribed patterns of how to silence a mother who fights to stay involved, who fights to demand rehabilitation of a problem that exploded beyond her capacity to manage. You will find addiction flourishing in full disregard of public safety. You will find the addicted sentenced with their addiction, their addiction fed while incarcerated, and their addiction killing them with certain eventuality after their release from serving time because of their addiction. You will also find stories of mothers who may not have had been notified that their child was stabbed to death or found in a corner dead with no single authority figure demonstrating the decency to explain to her what had happened. You will find too often that when people die behind bars in the state like ours, they're not even notified or their death investigated. Now, please be prepared to find an excitement of some to point out exceptions to the horrors. There are too far and few between. It is an undebatable data perspective. We hope that you will see the exceptions as enough knowledge to have done things differently. We hope that you will set a course for these investigations to indict these horrors, flaws, and incentivize a new construct of fairness, smart justice, effective corrections, and in the best interest of public safety for all. Thank you for being here and hearing us. 
Thank you, Ms. Wieson. And um, you know, the NIA has done a lot to connect families and connect people affected by um, these facilities to one another and to this type of a forum, hopefully so there can be change. So we're grateful for the work the NIA has done. And um, does the committee have any questions? Thank you, I appreciate it. Um, I want to go ahead and acknowledge Chairman of the House Democratic Caucus, Mr. Billy Mitchell, has come in. Representative Billy Mitchell, uh, we're glad to have you. Okay. You know, uh, <clears throat> let me put you with what number are you? Put your button. Uh, like that, Mr. Chairman. There we go. Great. Uh, I just want to say, you know, this is uh, I got here maybe about twenty minutes ago and had to work my way through the hallways because of so many folks that I knew that this issue was important to. Uh, I'm glad that I was able to appoint the, the, the chair and co-chair, uh, you, uh, Representative McLaren, you're doing a wonderful job with this issue, and so is your co-chair, Representative Schofield. This is an issue that we must get a grip on. I can think of no better group of legislators to tackle this issue, very serious and, and uh, respected and uh, certainly thoughtful and capable members of our legislature to get to, to this problem. I think that the, it, it, we can't create a society in which we just discard folks and don't care about uh, the rights that they do have uh, as it depends what's going on to those who are incarcerated. So let me just publicly thank you all for doing the great work that you do. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And. Um... You know, obviously it'll be one day at a time. We can't promise the moon on this because this is such a hard issue, but we can promise to keep paying attention, to keep amplifying these stories uh, and to not look away because that is how these problems have continued to have life is that people have just looked away. So we're gonna do our, our level best. Um, I'll now I wanna recognize Mr. Kit Cummings who has come before the committee. If you could go ahead and uh, introduce yourself, please. Absolutely, uh, Kit Cummings. Uh President and founder of the Power of Peace Project. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, I appreciate this opportunity and I'm uh, very, very grateful for the discussion. You can move the mic. Absolutely. You can, you should be able to. Yeah. So, 2008, I walked into Hay State Prison and that was at the peak of, of all the violence that was going on there. And after many years of ministry work, um, I was asked to share on behalf of faith leaders today, um, but after uh, years, I just, I lost my heart and went through a, a wilderness of uh, drug and alcohol. The rest of the family took me out, and I was in a dreamless state of life, and I was invited into Hay State Prison just to go and serve with the prison ministry, and those men weren't what I had been told they were, and so I just started making friends and kept going back and kept going back and tried an experiment in 2011, in honor of Dr. King's birthday, we tried a little a peace project in Georgia's most violent prison. And over the next year, we saw rival gangs come together and create the most peaceful time that prison had ever seen. And that's when Hayes won Institution of the Year um, for the state of Georgia. That took me on the road and it's led me to over 100 prisons, jails, detention centers across the country on four continents. So the incarcerated became my life. And the brothers and sisters behind that wire, they saved my life. And the program that I've developed has now been um, I'm contracted with the DJJ. I sit on the Gang uh, Prevention and Intervention Commission in the state of Georgia, do a lot of work with juvenile courts. But I'm here today just to say the difference in, in why this particular program, and I think ones like it, are effective is it's reward based rather than punitive. And Reward is so much more powerful than punishment. Right now, I've been tasked with Eastman uh, Juvenile Correctional Facility, which is the toughest in the state. Violent offenders, sex crimes. And, uh, and those brothers behind the wire, they just, all they have them down is the damn lockdown um, and just try to keep them away from one another. And so the hope that I provide and that we bring in is based on if you guys are given a big enough why and we give you the tools, would you be willing to work together to bring about peace? And they want to know why we want to do that. And so I start asking them, what do you want? And the more that I find out that they, that they, that they want that has been taken away, every time violence spikes, programs are taken away, freedom, rec, 
everything's taken away, they're locked down. Rarely, if ever, is it ever given back. And they certainly don't have an opportunity to earn it back. And so then when they get to the streets, they're more violent than when they went in. Programs that are incentive-based, and if I could make one change in the Georgia Department of Corrections, it would be to give these men hope that if they put in good work, that they get a good return. And I've seen amazing things. I've seen it in prisons around the country. I did the prison in a, a cartel-controlled prison in Tijuana, Mexico. It was based on, you know, I was at Eastman this week, and I went to these young men, and I go there each week, and I just started learning who, who they are, what they want, what their desires are. And I'm asking questions, and I'm listening. And the first thing that one of these tough kids said to me, they looked up and said, how we gonna, how we know you're going to come back? I've known him for 10 minutes and he's already having separation anxiety because nobody shows up. I said, you'll know when you know. And so Wednesday when I was there, I found him and I said, what'd you ask me last week when you come back? And so just showing up, now I found out what is important to them. What they love was their Xbox. They love their tablets. They need hygiene products. They want a little more rec time. Get me out of this dorm. You know, let us do some things. And so then I'm working with the, uh, the warden to say which of these are even a possibility. And now with this young group of men that are supposedly out of control, they're willing to start this program because we have given them light at the end of the tunnel. If you do this, and they're like, do what? Help me bring some peace to this place. We'll get you your tablets back. We'll get you more wreck. We can have leagues in here. Do you know if, if, you, if you let people run, they're tired at night? And they won't fight <laughs> if you actually, <laughs> it's that simple, run them, you know, like with kids, run them all day and they'll sleep at night. But if we keep these, not just the kids, but the brothers, sisters, the adults behind the wire, if we keep them in a perpetual state of lockdown, when they do get freedom, that's when they use it. So, you know, a, a mother, father can say, hey, son, when you get to prison, find the church. And I say, don't do that. <laughs> church is where bad things happen, drug deals, hits you know, sex. There's things happening in the churches and our prisons that keep people away that want faith. There's, I mean, the majority of, of brothers and sisters behind the wire, they want programs. Feed me. But they have been reduced to a dehumanized state. And what the country doesn't see and doesn't know about, they're not outraged about. A lot of my work is patterned after Dr. Martin Luther King. And I started following him when I was 25 years old. And the nation was not going to change. We got a long way to go until they knew what was happening. When they saw Selma in Birmingham, people were, were shocked and appalled, and there was pressure on politicians and governors and even the president to start making changes because they had to. And so I go to these boys this week, and I said, look, this is the way it is. You have to make the first move. The ones that are running things are not going to change. We've got to make the first move. And I say, we... And that means we've got to give them something. Give me some leverage, okay? Learn to work together. There is the Crips and the Bloods and the GDs. And they're at it all the time. And 100 times out of 100, when I've given men something to protect, some value, they will protect it. In one camp, it was NFL football. That's what they wanted. So I went to the man in charge, and I said, can, if, if they lay it down and work together, can we give them football back? And he said, yeah, but they won't do it. So I went back and we did our program, started studying King and studying the great peacemakers. And violence began to drop. We gave them the football back. And then a very powerful thing started to happen. When there were a couple of knuckleheads getting ready to go at it, the leaders would go and say, hey, you better figure that out. Don't get my info football taken away. And so there was a pressure that was a good pressure to keep the peace. And if we start giving them reasons to behave and reasons to believe and give them access to actual faith-based programs and they start experiencing a better quality of life, they get hooked on it and then they will protect it because we protect what we value. And what these men and women need is the ability to dream. They need some hope and hope is dangerous in a prison. And they tell me every time, one, they never give anything back. So why should we behave? They're young men and women, and they're just throwing tantrums. But if we give them something to believe in, and I'm telling you every single time, and I'll close with this, if I win their respect by coming back, and they see me fighting 
with and for them to get what they want, then I say, will you help me? And every time they say, just like these kids, this week on Wednesday, said, nobody's ever asked. And I said, will you work together if there's a big enough why? And this brother said, and I quote, he said, we're already, we're already working together. And I said, really? He's talking about robber gangs. He said, yeah, we're working together to do evil. Give me a reason to do good. We'll work together. Nobody ever asked us to. And so I'm appealing to not just this board, but the state of Georgia, create incentives and rewards and give them a reason to start doing the things that we want to do. And they might surprise us. They continue to surprise me. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Cummings. I mean, the, the phrase, nobody ever asked, right? I, I think it really echoes in this context. We have a couple of folks. First slide I saw was Representative Allen. Thank you very much for, for coming in for the work you do. My, my question is, is, it's gonna come across somewhat flippant, but how often do you work with the wardens? The, the work, the, the passion and what you just articulated to me is what our administrators within the prison should have. To be thinking in that way, not thinking that this is chattel, this is you know, people who have been discarded, but to say, we are an institution where we're gonna bring hope back in. And to Dr. Reinhardt's comment earlier, the, the disease, although he was talking about COVID, that starts in the prisons, that manifest in the streets, what you're basically saying is give them hope here, fix the gains here, and then we could probably fix the gains, gains out on the street instead of the reverse where we're looking at the streets, incarcerate them, and put them into a situation where the gain problem gets worse. So my question is, how often do you have those conversations, not just with the population, but with the administration, the wardens? Yes, that's a great question. Um, with the DJJ, it's the commissioner himself is if I don't have full buy-in and support, this cannot work. And so with the director I'm working with at Eastman, um, I'm working at, under him at his pleasure. And so I've got to work with him. He has to be able to trust me. And I have to be able to trust that don't, don't let me go promise something to them that did not deliver. They didn't have met their whole life. And so once I, I win the respect and the trust of uh, the man or woman in charge, now I can go and work with the kids. But on Wednesday, I said, listen, I'm working with the warden. And you guys are going to have to be OK with that because I can't get you what you want if I'm not working with them. You guys are going to be OK with that. So it's straight up on both sides. But I've got to have support. The buy-in from the staff looks like this. I was standing waiting to get back in the dorm. And there's a correctional officer next to me, a wonderful lady. And I, I said, I can't imagine your job. And she rolled her eyes and said, you have no idea. And I said, you probably have kids. She said, yeah. I said, you got grandkids? She said, yeah. I said, you've got to take everything you see and hear today home to, to your family. I said, my job is to help you have less things to take home. You know, what if I was able to make your job easier? And she's like, praise God, how do I help? You know, and so I think there's just such a win in this. I mean, for the director, it's a win. For the kids, it's a win. For the staff all the way up to the commissioner himself. And so there's no lose in this that I can see. Um, they are the solution. And to your other comments, sir, I believe my latest book is The New Convict Code, Bringing Peace to the Streets from Behind the Wire. If we do this right, those men and women of power behind the wire, they're the only ones those young men and women are going to listen to. So the gang problem in the streets can be solved from behind the wire, but we've got to teach them and give them the tools. I hope I answered you did, you did. And what you basically said is that we have a complex, comprehensive problem that can be solved with the right mindset yes, and the right buy-in. Yes, sir. And right now we don't have it. And we've got to work together with uh, corrections. I appreciate you. And I think prison reform, how in the world are we gonna reform a prison system without getting the, uh, the, the brother and sister behind the wire, wire behind it? Yeah, the streets need to fix the streets. We Thank can. you. Appreciate it. Thank I appreciate you for you. that. And uh, Chair Schofield. I, first of all, I want to say thank you for allowing God to use you. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, when life gives us, we, we don't know the calling until we're actually in the calling and doing the calling. So thank you for everything that you're doing. A couple of things that you mentioned, I, I think what stood out to me is that um, we protect what we value. 
And so again, the opportunity to allow people to dream out loud and to actively listen is um, is really important and imperative. And it was something my colleague had said, you know, you we are holding, we want to hold the people accountable, accountable, but we're not holding the leadership mm -hmm. accountable. So you're asking them to, to transform, but the leadership has not had any responsibility or any accountability on how they transform, how they see the people that are uh, our family members, our incarcerated loved ones. So we've got to start holding a, a different demand on them. It's, it's okay to have buy into your program, but I can buy into your program and never change. And I am still the cause of the problem. So, you know, I'd like to see how we can start implementing some things to force that change to happen. Um, the other thing was um, just being there and being present is, um, I mean, it means the world of difference. Uh, you know, we are trying to transform this, this system through um, some legislation that I'm working on, police and, and um, uh, Co Correction Accountability Act, uh, Prison and, and Correction Accountability Act. Um, this has to happen. And, and the reason why, and I know Dr. Reinhardt, he understands, but here's what we didn't talk about, is the money that we make off of devaluing human lives. That is the real issue. It is a level of racism that is in this state that the more I keep them in, and as my colleague uh, Beth said this, uh, this morning about, um, we're, this is not the Department of Correction. There is no correction, no corrective actions going on. When we have programs like these transformative programs that are, are exactly what is needed in there, you know, we will not fund or we will, um, I wouldn't say defund, we're just not funding the, the future of people. Why, why is it that I can work inside a kitchen in these prisons, but when I come out, I can't get a job outside? Come on now, let's, let's start being honest. It's that you make more money to keep them in there. And if I can break a spirit, then I've got them for life. So thank you for restoring hope. I really appreciate and, that. And very infamous, hope is the new dope. Hope is the uh, new dope. Come on, man. I love it. Don't I steal love it. it. No, I, you, you, you got that. Hope is the new dope. And that's what we're here to do. Beyond hope, we want life. I want to see the vision that you're helping in their vision board come to life. You know, this is not the end. There are second chances. And if we are a redemptive society, we need to start valuing humanity the way that uh, God has, has, has valued us. I say amen to everything you said. Thank you. And we got a, we got one final comment here from Rep Moore. Thank you, Mr. Cummings, for joining us today and for sharing your experience with the Georgia Department of Corrections. Uh, I have uh, not a question, but just a statement to follow up everything that you you've shared with us today. Um, as Representative Schofield alluded to, I just wanted to thank you for um, for helping the Department of Corrections actually live up to their name. And um, you know, I just wanted to put on the record here that I want to call on Governor Kemp and Commissioner Ward to embrace the programming that you've created and have shown objectively works you know, to heal our prison population and the crime that goes on within that system. And if the governor is concerned about rising crime rates, well, he needs to look at his own Department of Corrections yeah. and look to community partners like you who have solutions to that. And I, I really appreciate your statement earlier that, you know, to solve the crime that we're seeing in the streets, we need to address that within the prison population because they are one in the same. And they, they literally saved this man's life. I owe them one. And so I won't stop. I mean, I love every one of the 2.3 million behind there. And I believe that all of them, I, I tell them, I'm not coming here to bring God to you. I'm coming here to fight God in you. Yeah. And that changes them. At least when they're around me. <laughs> God bless you, sir. Uh, well, I'm very encouraged. God bless you. For what you're doing. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Cummings. We appreciate so much what you're doing and your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. All right, our final witness uh, for the hearing is scheduled today is uh, Ms. Karima Hanifa. If she could come in.
welcome, Miss Aniva. And um, if you'd like, please, um, let's see, I have to do one witness one at a time. So if you could introduce yourself and your guests to the committee. You could use that mic there. Let's point it over. My name is Karina Anifa, and sitting with me is Alina Casilio. And Ms. Anifa, obviously, oops, obviously you've heard a lot uh, today from other witnesses and from the committee about why we're here. And I know that you have a story to tell um, related to both the Arendelle specifically, I think, but also the broader set of issues. And so if you could uh, testify to what the information you're in possession of that would, would help us do our task. So again, my name is Karima Hanifa. I spent 26 years inside, 26 consecutive years inside the Georgia Department of Corrections. Um, I'm currently a student at Life University and a community organizer with Humane Atlanta. Much of my first three years were spent in solitary confinement because I was 15 years old when I was arrested. So from 15 to 18, I spent a lot of time in solitary confinement until I was of age to actually be placed into population. Um, I am in contact with about 80 ladies that are incarcerated. Um, the majority of them have uh, rather large sentences, uh, 20, 30 year mandatory up into life sentences. The majority of them are women. I do have a few male um, friends who I was in contact with over the years who I still am in contact with. Um, most of um, what I saw during those 26 years um, was mild compared to what is happening now. So I've been home for two years. Like, um, it'll be three years in April. And um, there were always um, issues. Um, anytime you have like, uh, myself, I had a life sentence. And so um, in the beginning of my sentence, there wasn't a lot that was available to me because of the length of my sentence. So I wasn't allowed to get immediately to um, use the educational programming, um, unable to get a trade, unable to take certain classes, which are like rehabilitative, right? Um, when you are incarcerated to kind of prepare you for release. Um, because I was uh, sentenced to two consecutive life sentences, there was a point when like, um, I was very hopeless because I didn't, I didn't, I didn't understand um, in my youth and also uh, with such a large sentence that there would be a time when I would be released. So while I was denied access to educational programs, um, I really didn't understand the importance early in my sentence. Later on in my sentence, I understood like I needed to plan for my release. I needed to begin to uh, formulate a plan to prepare me for one day when I came back out so that I would never go back and be successful. Um, a lot of the complaints that I received probably on a daily basis um, are a lot of the um, just uh, basic rights um, for a human being, such as um, specifically with the women, um, access to sanitary items, clean water. Um, oddly enough, during those 26 years, and it's still that way now, in the summertime, the water is scalding hot. And in the winter, it is freezing cold. This is something that always happens. It's, it hasn't been a year where it's like, hey, it didn't happen this year. It happens, right? Um, I want to say that um, any uprise that uh, or surge in violence in the state of Georgia uh, Department of Corrections is a direct result of one longer sentences. Um, I'm so sorry, Ms. Hanifa. What I might do is move this microphone over to you because there are folks online having a hard time hearing you, but if I turn the volume up too high, then we get feedback. <laughs> Which one right there? We could try the other mic. That might be. That might help, but let's also, if we could, <laughs> that'll help the folks online. Does, it, does this help? Can you see me? Okay. Uh, well, uh, could you switch seats, sure. please? Thank you. Sorry for the hiccup. No worries. Problem. Okay. Is this better? Okay, that yes. should be better. Let's let's try that. Okay. okay. All right. Great. Right. So um, I was just saying that any uprise and surge in violence in the Georgia Department of Corrections is a direct result of one 
longer sentences. So we have a population of people. When I went to prison, life was seven, right? Before you were considered for parole. But I ended up spending 26 years in prison before I actually made parole, 20 years before they even began to look at me. So now we have people who are sentenced to 30 year life sentences, right? So hypothetically, if you're 15 years old and you catch a life sentence, which is 30 years, you'll be 45 before parole even looks at you. You'll be 44 before you can even be considered to get an educational program and before you can take substance abuse and cognitive thinking skills and motivation for a change of just groups that just kind of help you think differently. You gotta wait for at least, you know, 29 years before you're eligible for medical treatment is uh, is also will be a, you know, uh, the response will be a surge in violence. So I have ladies who email me who um, specifically, there's a woman who um, was diagnosed as having pneumonia for many, many, many years. She's never smoked. Finally, she's diagnosed as stage four lung cancer. Well, she's a lifer. Um, she began to use the grievance process, which resulted in her being transferred from institution to institution. It's a, a paperwork shuffle. Anytime you remove, you're, you kind of lose track of your items. And so by the time she was able to settle and backtrack, um, the grievance could not be found. It was almost like it never happened. So um, medical treatment, um, inhum inhumane living conditions. So I have, I have seen sewage backups where you would think that, you know, uh, and I, when we think about our homes and society, that your kitchen is your kitchen, your bathroom is your bathroom, right? But to see um, sewage backup, raw sewage come up out of the pipeline and it be there for days and having to walk in it, right? That is inhumane to smell it and to see it. Um, and then to see people with that waste in the bottom of their pants legs, right? Laundry only goes out like literally two days a week. So you either wash these items on hand right? You're only given one bar of soap. That is something else. So the state issues one bar of soap. So once again, inhumane, a state of hopelessness. When I say hopelessness, there has been a surge in uh, K2, which is a synthetic marijuana that causes like hallucination. Um, that also causes like women who normally like bring themselves together daily, not for visitation, but just daily, to stop bringing themselves together, to stop putting on the bare minimal makeup, to stop combing their hair, to kind of do almost like a how dog shuffle. This is the response to the medication, the, the synthetic drug in their system. Um, the question is always like, how are people getting it or why are people doing it? So that state of hopelessness that I got to be here for 30 years and visitation has not been something that has been readily available because of COVID, right? And so you don't get a visit, you don't get to see your kids, and plus you're gonna be here for 30 years and people wanna escape their that mental state. Even if it's just for a few hours, knowing that it's highly addictive and knowing that they really can't afford it and knowing that it could cause severe brain damage and physical harm, but people still do it because they're hopeless, right? When I was in prison, it was rare, like there's something called buck, which is like um, false, it's like liquor, homemade liquor. It's very common in the men's prison. When I went to prison, I remember like seeing a bottle and like thinking, what is that? To literally on Fridays, 20 bottles, 30 bottles of buck is found, right? It's discovered as contraband because people are looking for a way to escape. It's like, what else do you do, right? You have fecal matter in your water and showers are the wrong temperature and not access to medical treatment. So what do you do? You find a way to escape. And it's the same thing with substance abuse out here. People choose drugs when their reality just doesn't work for them. Um, the the post-traumatic stress disorder that is associated with incarceration and social conditioning. If you keep somebody locked in a room in solitary confinement for five years, eight years, 10 years, what do you expect the response to be, right? If you treat someone like an animal, you feed them through a flap. When I was in prison, you could only be housed in solitary confinement for 28 days. On the 29th day, you had to be released for 24 hours. That doesn't exist anymore. People spend years in solitary confinement. But there was an SOP in place that said 28 days was the max. They had to let you out, give you your property for 24 hours, and then put you back in. How many mothers, sons, sisters, and daughters will be denied adequate medical care? This is about asking the right questions to help us rethink Georgia's carceral system. Humane living conditions, the example I gave, is not just fecal matter, but mold in the showers, right? There is mold that is covered up when guests come and it's covered up with paint. We all know that mold doesn't go away. 
like there's a process for it. If you cover it up, it literally bleeds through the paint. It may take six months, but it comes back. Um, the kitchen area not being up to par. And then the mold also in the water closet. Access to clean drinking water. Access to female sanitary items. The right to safety. Like just because a person commits a crime, do they not deserve to be safe? Or should they not be protected from violence? Should violence be uh, imposed upon them, not just by their peers, but by officers as well? When they're, we are still humans, they are still humans. The question is, are they locked out or are they locked in? Is not all life grievable? What does the justice system truly aim to achieve? Does Georgia's Department of State holders have any interest in rehabilitation? Is it the inevitable loss of hope? Is that what they want? Is it the refusal to treat our incarcerated population humanely, giving them the basic necessities, which are clean water, food, safety, and housing? Do we truly believe that prison in itself is sufficient punishment for crime, or do we believe that the, that the, the best punishment is death? So we leave our population incarcerated and let them be killed and kill each other. Oh, they're just felons, let them, let them kill each other, right? That's inhumane. People make mistakes, but every life is redeemable. I'm proof. The system says that a child that suffers trauma cannot be reformed. The frontal lobe is not developed. So there is no comeback, but I'm proof that there is comeback. I recommend that a grievance system that system that requires accountability and transparency exists. The grievance system is a joke in prison. You write a grievance, there is retaliation. You write a grievance, it is destroyed. You write a grievance, they act like it never happened. You write a grievance, you are transferred. You write another grievance, you are transferred. By the third transfer, all of the paperwork looks the same. Every time there has been a problem and I follow, I have videos that I've saved of prison violence. And all I can say is I'm just grateful that I made it out, but I left behind so many people who don't deserve to live like this. And the answer is always wait, wait, wait. It's always wait. It's always, oh, there's a plan in motion. Oh, things are gonna get better. Oh, this is gonna be fixed. But the state just announced that there was like a two billion overflow of money from the fiscal year. Why? Because there was no need to buy chairs. There was no visitation. There was no need to buy recreational equipment. There were no church services because COVID shut the institutions down. If every person that is incarcerated, almost every person, 90% of the population will one day be released, you should be afraid. These people will be our neighbors who are tormented who are treated inhumanely, who live in deplorable, you know, people think about how is it a person goes from incarceration, incarceration to homelessness. The state is supposed to be responsible for feeding and caring and medical treatment and mental health services. But if those are not available, the transition isn't very difficult to go from being incarcerated to living outside of the capital. It's not difficult to use bathrooms that don't work, to wait to go from you know, uh, an incident to lockdown and being placed in a shower for 24 hours and having to use a bathroom in the drains, that's not a whole lot different from people who are homeless here in Atlanta who become acclimated with using the bathroom behind bushes and behind buildings. It happens. There are instances when there isn't uh, a maintenance person that is there and you go the whole weekend with your toilet stopped up. That is inhumane to have to smell it because while you are incarcerated, you don't pay taxes, but somebody is. When I was incarcerated, my mother's tax money, my father's tax money paid to make sure that I was safe, paid to make sure that I had adequate medical treatment. And I wanna close with a quote that I find very, uh, appropriate for today. And it is a quote by Dr. Martin Luther King that says, justice delayed is justice denied. For every day that we wait to make a change within the system, someone else dies. Every single day 
I see people dying, dying, dying. And I don't mean a report. There are videos on social media of people laying in their own blood. And it makes my stomach flip. And all I can say is I'm just grateful that I made it out. But what about all these people who are still incarcerated, who can't get out? And they don't have nobody to call. They don't have anybody to save them. And today, that's who I speak for. For 26 years, that was my life. And they say, oh, if you can make it, anybody can make it. I agree and I disagree. Because everything that I obtained while I was incarcerated, I had to fight for. I had to fight to make sure that when I came out, I had a support system. I had somewhere I could work. I had somewhere to live. But if people are treated like animals, they can come out here and it's okay to be homeless. It's okay to commit another crime. It's a, it. And that's all I have to say. Thank you, Ms. Anitha. And uh, we really appreciate you relaying both your own experiences, but also the experiences of all the people that you speak for. I think, well, I'll save my thoughts for just a moment. We've got a couple of folks. Um, Representative Beth Moore. Ms. Neath, I just want to thank you so much for having the courage to come forward today and, and share your experience and also to speak on behalf of those who are incarcerated who cannot be here to speak for themselves. Um, I don't have a question, just a reflection. You know, the civility of a society can be measured by how it treats its incarcerated people. And it's clear that Georgia is failing that test. That's all I need to say. Representative Allen. Thank you for your testimony. I, I just have a couple of questions. The first one is, um, what do you study in life, university? Positive human development and social change. Good for you. That, that's exciting. It, to me, that is the, the capstone of the story that you told. Um, but the second question is, you, you mentioned that from 15 to 18, you were in solitary confinement. I can't help but to think, and, and I hope you tell me I'm wrong, but that was not done for your benefit. It was done because possibly they could not keep you protected in general population at that age. Um, why were you in solitary confinement for those first three years? So, um, because I transitioned from the juvenile to the jail, it was perceived as different than a seven, on my 17th birthday, I was moved from the juvenile system to the adult system. It was perceived that um, there was a difference in mentality of a 17-year-old coming off the street versus a 17-year-old that had been incarcerated for the previous two years. And so when I was taken to Fulton County Jail, I was automatically placed into like protective custody is what it was called. Mm -hmm. And I was kept there for six months. Prior to that, um, when I first came into the juvenile justice um, system, um, I was housed at 445 Capitol Avenue, which I think is an empty lot now. Um, when I first got there because of my charges, right, because I was a violent offender and because like all the other kids were like locked up for like truancy and running away from home, I was placed in um, solitary confinement. And literally like if I chose not to go to school, I would be placed back in solitary confinement. So like any infraction was automatic. It's like you got a violent crime anyway, you know, we're going to lock you up, we're going to lock you up, we're going to lock you up. And so it just was like repetition, but it would happen for like six months at a time. Okay. And, and to, to my colleagues, I just want to point out something that not only has been said here in, in this testimony, but in others about visitation. It, it really struck me that we had one of our fiercest floor debates last year on the visitation and people crying because they couldn't go see someone in the hospital because of COVID. But everybody up here has not had the privilege of that same advocacy. And no one went to the well and cried because those that were incarcerated have been locked out of their family and their care systems because of COVID. It is the hypocrisy of the difference in how we treat those that are incarcerated that has frustrated me in these testimonies today, but has also given me the passion to move forward for all of us to enact the change that we can. And I think that's our challenge. And I appreciate you as well as everyone else who testified to remind us of our why. So thank you. Chair Schofield. I just want, I want to, sorry. I just thank you for being here. And one of the things and the reason why we are doing this and why we're here today 
is because it's not just the Hanifas that made it out. It's the voices that I hear that I will never get to see or hear their fate. So I want you to know. I know, you know, everybody says, how long? We don't know how long, but I know the process has begun. And we will not stop until we see more Hanifas. And that the work that you put in and to survive, that, yeah, I get it. You know, they say, if you can do it, anybody can do it. But let's make sure that we give a fair chance for everybody who needs to get the help they need in and out. Y'all, they don't give Democrats microphones very often. So it, it takes a minute for us to learn how to use them. Um, uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Anifa. And um, uh, I want to give my sincere gratitude to everybody who came today, not just a panelist or witness, but members of media, uh, members of the public, advocates. Um, this is the only way that we are going to get change is to keep telling stories. And we are not under the illusion that Governor Kemp or Commissioner Ward is going to do an about face tomorrow and implement a bunch of policies that are pro-social and pro-human. Uh, but what we do know is that these problems that we've talked about today are not gonna go away on their own because we ignore them. And that's the policy that this state has taken for far too long. I think we have basically one fundamental question that we have to ask ourselves as state leaders, and that is, are we here to destroy lives or are we here to heal communities? because that choice is going to define the course that we take. And right now, whether the state wants to admit it or not, the Department of Corrections is choosing to destroy lives. So it is our sincere hope as a committee, echoing the comments of my colleagues today, uh, that we can chart a new course in the state of Georgia, and we're gonna to work to do that. Um, that's gonna conclude our committee hearing today. We really appreciate, again, everybody being here. Uh, individually will be available uh, for comment or uh, to discuss next steps if anybody would like. But um, again, thanks. Hope, hope everybody has a great day. Thank you, Mr. Chair.